Uh, we're continuing on in our series in Matthew, and uh, today we're going to start a next section in Matthew about how the perspective of Jesus and his kingdom is actually different than the world in which we live in. Jesus sees things and people differently, and I wish I could tell you that the way he sees them always makes us more comfortable. That's simply not true. And so we're going to look at uh, two things specifically, but th they have some additional things attached to them. So how does Jesus see marriage and how does Jesus see money? And, and I know you're th rethinking your decision to come today. Like, what could go wrong? He's going to talk about marriage and money. I think for a lot of people in our culture, they consider marriage an outdated institution now. Uh, some just think that it limits their freedom far too much. And there are people who think that it complicates their life in terms of, of legal issues and in terms of finances. If a marriage ends, there's the division of assets. There could be alimony, custody, child support. And we have a very high divorce rate in our culture, so there are people who make the argument, if marriages are not surviving at an alarmingly high rate, what makes us think that this institution belongs in our culture any longer? And then there are lots of alternatives to marriage that people seem to be employing in our culture, and so how are we to think about this? And it's a good question. And I think that one of the questions we should think about is, should what is happening, or more specifically, what is not working in our culture, be the decision maker for how we think about things? So today we're going to take a look at how Jesus looks at things like marriage and money. In Matthew 19 it said, when Jesus had finished saying these things, that phrase appears five times in Matthew's Gospel, because there are five major themes that Jesus addresses. So he's just concluded one, and now he's going into another. He left Galilee and went to the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Once again, aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> Let's see if we can unpack this. The first thing I want you to see is that following Jesus brings healing. Multitudes followed him, and he healed them. And healing isn't just for physical issues. There are emotional, relational, marital, financial. There are a lot of areas in our life that require healing, and following Jesus is the way we can start thinking about that. Because we all have areas that we feel broken in and wounded in. And now the Pharisees come and they want to test, or the word is even better translated, trap Jesus. And it doesn't matter what his response is to the question that they ask. They have a passage from Deuteronomy 24. It's a very complicated passage, and if I were to teach on that, I'd have to have a whole series just devoted to it, related to marriage and divorce and, and all of those things. And so they know that they can make an argument from a position other than what Jesus just declared. And so they're ready to try to trap him. And at this time, there were two basic schools of thought in Judaism about marriage. And they both came from two significant rabbis. One rabbi was called Shimei, and, and his belief was that uh, you could not divorce your spouse for any reason other than adultery. And then there was another rabbi, and his name was Hillel, and Hillel believed that you could divorce your wife or your spouse for any reason, including if she burned the dinner, if she didn't clean the clothes the way you wanted to, if the house wasn't kept the way that you preferred. Are you ready for this? If you saw a woman more beautiful than her and she looked less attractive to you, 
That's justifiable reason for divorce. All you had to do was to write on a piece of paper. We are now divorced. And you give it to her and she goes out of the house with the clothes on her back. Now for those one or two of you who think that that's still a good idea. <laughs> this is what's really interesting is the Pharisees focused on divorce, but Jesus' response is to focus on marriage. There, there's a lot of wisdom in thinking about that. And Jesus reminded them and us that in Genesis, the first chapter, he made them male and female. This is, Jesus doesn't do things by accident. They just said that the person who had the authority and the responsibility, the acting agent who's authorized is the male. Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus goes back and says, well, just remember God made them male and female. And in this, Jesus dignifies the female, the woman. And they're often the ones who are being oppressed by the system that existed in that day. And so Jesus reminds us that the first couple belong together. In fact, there's a phrase that we still use in our culture that comes from Genesis 1. They were made for each other. That's where that phrase comes from. And what Jesus does is he reminds us that God made Adam and Eve, he made male and female in a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. And it's within the context of a covenant of marriage. And in that context, sex is not just good, it's also considered holy. And this is a concept that even our culture today struggles with. And, and so we, we have trouble even having conversations about this. Jesus also pointed out something else, that marriage is the priority relationship. He reminded them of the Genesis passage where it says that a man leaves his father and mother and he's united to his wife. Uh, in in the uh, uh, King James Version, uh, it says he cleaves to his wife. That word got me in a lot of trouble one time. It did. I was preaching, I was very young, and I had more energy than sense. And, and I, I referred to that passage, I said, a man leaves his parents and cleaves to his wife, and, and one of the reasons marriages don't survive today is a lack of cleavage. And, and then they let me pastor this church, go figure. <laughs> it's amazing what you, you can say without trying to say something that stupid, but it happened to me. And, you know, for those of you who find great delight in that, I could say something stupid before the day is out. It, it could happen. Um, Jesus talks about marriage being the priority, and in the ancient world, uh, that's not how they thought about it the most important relationship was the relationship with your parents. And in the ancient world for the passage that Moses uh, wrote down that, that says you leave your father and mother, uh, this, this violated every cultural understanding. And what, is, what is God getting at? What is Jesus reminding us of? And it's, it's simply this, is that the priority relationship once you get married is your spouse. That before your spouse, when you're raised up in a home, your parents have the primary shaping influence in your life. But once you are married, the primary shaping influence in your life is your spouse. And so there's this stepping away. Now, in case you think that that means in some way that parents are to be dishonored or not respected, Jesus reminds us really that we have two things in scripture that we have to keep in tension. And one is in Genesis, in marriage, we leave our parents, and for some people, that takes a lot longer than we thought. And then, and then there's the fifth commandment, which says to honor your father and mother. And we really need the gospel. We really need God's word. We really need prayer to be able to live out that tension in a healthy way. So we're to leave. And, and this, this leave means uh, our parents and, and, and be united. Don't abandon your spouse. Uh, love them. Support them. 
It's an exclusive relationship, and exclusivity promotes intimacy. I, I know that we, are, we have arguments about that all the time, but honestly, when you think about it, all the way from back when you were dating uh, to present time, if you're married, I mean, just think about this. When you had an exclusive relationship with someone, it seemed to promote intimacy, and if one of those partners started having a relationship with someone else, you weren't happy about that. It immediately had an eroding effect on intimacy. And so what Jesus is reminding us is that in marriage, we're no longer independent. We're no longer isolated. But that doesn't mean that there's not the ongoing development of the individual. That marriage is not the loss of your identity. It's the merging of two people to support what God wants to develop in the other person. Marriage is more than two consenting adults. It's a coordination of two people. Now, I'm not the most coordinated person in the world, but I can get across the stage uh, without falling down. I, 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 I have some coordination. Uh, every, every day when I'm at staff with lunch, I will take the napkin that I'm using and I turn around and I toss it into the, the basket uh, that's near the counter. And the number of times that I've actually made that in the course of my entire ministry, you could probably count on one hand. And, uh, and they've offered to go pick it up for me. And I said, no, 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 I'll, I, it was my miss, and, and I'll pick it up. And, and one person even said, well, I distracted you. It's my fault. I said, well, it may be your fault, but it's my responsibility. And I go pick it up. That's, how, that's one of the ways I get my steps in. <laughs> I go pick up my missed shots. He says, what God has joined together, the word there is yoked, what God has yoked together. The word yoked is a work picture. Marriage is not just sleeping together or living together. It's working together in a coordinated way. Jesus actually tells us this in our spiritual relationship. Take my yoke upon you. What is he saying? <laughs> Two. There we go. I'm pulling for you. In marriage, we pull for each other rather than pulling apart. That's why Jesus says, stop tearing marriage apart. So then that question, how does Jesus actually see divorce? And uh, the first thing I want to acknowledge is that there are, I know there are people in the room who have experienced divorce. You may be in the process of divorce, and I have not come to throw a single stone at anyone today. I know that is an incredibly painful thing to have to go through. A lot of people have been deeply wounded by marriages that did not survive, and then they have felt isolated or even rejected by people of faith. And I don't think that's the role of the church. The Pharisees came and they wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to trick Jesus. And so Jesus corrected, is it lawful? Didn't Moses command? And Jesus corrects them and he said, Moses permitted. Moses didn't command divorce. Moses permitted divorce. Jesus is the one who correctly interprets Scripture. And one of the challenges is that we often fail to see all of the people who are affected by divorce. And, and, and uh, someone says, well, doesn't it say in the Bible uh, God hates divorce? And it does say that uh, in Malachi. It's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. But, but God is not saying he hates divorced people. It, it would be much like if you had a friend or a loved one who was, who was going through an experience of cancer and the outcome of their survival is unknown. You would very easily say you hate cancer. That doesn't mean you hate the person who has it. it it's thinking like that. And this is what Jesus wants us to understand. Uh, so Deuteronomy, this is interesting, Genesis gives us God's created order, and Deuteronomy gives us permission for divorce. And what I have to tell you is, and what Jesus is reminding the, the Pharisees is that both of those things are in the Bible. Both of those things are in the Bible. Whoever divorces his wife commits adultery. So this is where uh, I've heard some very uh, strong language used around this and quite honestly, in ways abusive to certain people. And so let's just unpack this a little bit. And I am, I'm really strapped for time today. I'm trying to tackle a lot, so we'll see how far I get. 
But whoever divorces his wife commits adultery. Remember, the concept is, is that you can divorce your wife for any reason. You burn the toast. The woman I just saw walking down the street is more beautiful than you. And what Jesus is saying is when you think like that, just because you give somebody a piece of paper doesn't mean that what's going on in your heart is any different than the person who does that in secret. You are tempted, you are attracted, and you are taking action on that. And just because you write it out on a piece of paper and think that you make it legal doesn't change what's going on in your heart. That's what he's talking about. So, by acknowledging that Moses permitted divorce, Jesus is also protecting people who have been divorced. He doesn't want them to experience a lot of shame and cruelty. Sexual infidelity tears intimacy apart. So how is the church supposed to respond to people who are considering divorce or people who have been through divorce? How are we supposed to respond to a person who's been unfaithful? And they are actually the person who's responsible for the dissolution of a marriage. And uh, the first thing I would say is we don't have the right as a church to be hard-hearted towards those who have been wounded or to those who have afflicted those wounds. There's no, no place in Scripture that indicates that we have the right to be abusive to other people because they have failed in some way or they have been on the receiving end of another person's failure. The gospel is good news for everyone for everyone. So we're supposed to have a high view of marriage from Scripture, but we're not to abandon the gospel. Remember the woman in Luke chapter 7 who was a sinful woman who receives from forgiveness from Jesus, or the woman who was actually caught in adultery in John chapter 8, and she receives no condemnation, or the person, the woman who was at the, uh, in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, who had been married and divorced multiple times and was currently living with someone who is not her spouse. How did Jesus interact with her? In every case, there was forgiveness available. But please understand this. Forgiveness of sins is not for those who believe they have no sin to forgive. And if we justify our actions, then what we're saying is, I don't need the forgiveness of Jesus. And let's just take a poll this morning. How many in the room believe you still need the forgiveness of Jesus? Yep, yeah, that's good. So when Jesus' teaching uh, is followed people are healed. Now, let's go on. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> wow. And Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs, that's kind of a, it's an archaic word, and often an uncomfortable word, but it is actually used to describe singleness. There are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. There are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. The one who can accept this should accept it. The disciples' response to hearing Jesus talking about marriage said, it'd be better if we're not married. There's something in the way they think that the option of having a different spouse makes marriage more attractive. Huh. And, and Jesus challenges that. And uh, so he says, he starts talking about singleness, and this is what's important. He doesn't command marriage, and he doesn't command singleness, but he does treat both equally and with dignity. Jesus honors the single life and the married life. And in the ancient world, that was unheard of. In Judaism alone, there's very few examples uh, in Scripture of people who did not marry. Uh, Elisha, Elijah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God actually told him not to marry, not to have any children, and not to go to anybody else's wedding. There might be a couple of guys in here who would take the last part of that just to not have to go to anybody else's wedding. And, and John the Baptist. And by the way, Jesus was never married. Uh, Jesus identifies three categories of singleness, and the first is, has to do with genetics. There's something about the way that the human body was born so that some people are unable to participate in sexual intimacy. And Jesus honors those people. Then there are people who are made eunuchs by others. And in the ancient world, this was something that when you conquered a people, sometimes you would castrate them. 
You'd make it impossible for them to reproduce. If you were a politically ambitious person, you would often submit to that action by another because in order for you to be around kings or great leaders, they didn't want you interacting or interfering in any way with their women. And so that would be the price you would pay in order to advance your political career. And if, in case you think nobody would do that today, the number of people who will sacrifice their uh, intimate relationships with other people in order to advance their career is way more than we think. Way more. Uh, it's also fair to say Jesus said that that was done by others. And there are some people who have been through such traumatic events in their life that the desire to be involved in a, a physically intimate relationship is something they no longer have. And Jesus does not condemn that. He doesn't tell them to get over that. Jesus just says, that's also a standard of singleness. And then the last standard is for those who willingly make that decision for themselves so that they can give themselves to the kingdom. And, and Jesus says, let the person who can handle this, handle it. Make room for it. He placed the single life next to the married life. And, and so this is, he didn't command, he didn't tell his disciples, by the way, pray for the gift of, of singleness. He's honoring both. Does that make sense? Okay. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. In this passage, we learn how children and quite honestly, others can be brought to Jesus. Luke's gospel actually uses the phrase for babies. These aren't just little children running around and having to break into the circle. They're being brought by their parents for the purpose of Jesus touching them and blessing them. And what we can see is that the disciples kind of took it on themselves to limit who had access to Jesus. And they thought that if a person was incapable, if they're too small and, and too intellectually unable to be able to make decisions about discipleship, they don't belong in the conversation. And Jesus said, let them in. Jesus never touches anybody without purpose, and he never blesses anybody without purpose. How many are glad Jesus says to the children, let them come to me? And he has a blessing for every single one of them. That's, that's exactly how it should be. Yeah. And, and then the disciples, uh, 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 the, even though they tried to limit, Jesus actually goes even further and says, um, the kingdom is for them. Then Jesus offers some perspective on money. And uh, uh, some of you are very glad now that I only have a couple minutes left in this message. Uh, it says, just then a man came up. If you compile all the gospels together, you know he's rich, you know he's young, you know he's a ruler. Three things everybody wants to be. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Great question. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, what good deed must I do? Most people, in fact, all religions of the world assume that whatever their version of eternal life is, is a result of something we do or something we know. And Jesus presents a different option. It's something to be. Really interesting concept. The rich young man says, how can I, what must I do hmm, 
to have to get eternal life. He sees, he sees eternal life as just another possession to acquire. And giving to the poor was held in very high uh, uh, regard in those days by spiritual people. And so my expectation is that he thought Jesus would ask him for a significant donation to do exactly that. He anticipated that. But what Jesus asks is not for him to give money to Jesus. What Jesus asks is to give away the thing upon which he has built his identity. And this is what I can tell you. It's hard to give away something that you believe you need. It's even harder to give away something that your identity is built on. And he had built his identity on his possessions. So the first thing Jesus says is he points the man to God. He's, he's, you know, what good thing must I do? And he says, why are you talking to me about good things? God is who is good. He starts, what's the first command? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God. That's the first command. What he's doing is, before he says keep the commandments, he wants to connect the man to the source of the commandments. Eternal life, Jesus says, is a gift we receive, not an achievement that we earn. If you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Jesus makes eternal life sound more like a gift than an acquisition. This is really interesting. So the man indicated that he had obeyed all of these. What else must I do? And so what we're discovering is what he really worships and what he, we're about to discover. He worships all the stuff that he has. And Jesus had told him, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And, we'll, and when we get to chapter 22, we'll talk more about what that means. But the concept of neighbor, we think of neighbor uh, in terms of people who are like us. And Jesus says, your neighbor is the person who is near you, not just like you. And we're to have love for that person, just like we have love for ourselves. Jesus does not interpret neighbor as some kind of romantic ideal of a nebulous group of people that we can't put a name to. He says, love your neighbor. I have to say at this point that for some people, we do fall into the category of this rich, young ruler, and not because we have so much, although by most of the world's standards we really do, but also because um, we get a little bit bored with our faith. There must be something else to do. There must be something else to know. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. There must be something else to do. And we want to be fascinated. We want to be excited. We want to be energized. And those moments can happen in our life, but our faith is not just about what we're fascinated about. It's not just constantly trying to be entertained. And so he tells this man, who's still looking for something else to do, take your possessions, sell them, give them to the poor, which raises some problems, to be honest. First of all, is Jesus commanding this for all people, all of his disciples? And the answer is no, he's not. But I have a word of caution for you. If you find a lot of comfort and feel a lot better because I just said that, you might not be generous enough. And then, isn't it a problem if he has all this, this resource and he gives it to somebody else, aren't they going to have the same problems? And the answer is, is that when we're helping someone who is in need, that's not the same thing as building our identity on what we have. We're back to the original issue, following Jesus heals. When we have a very unhealthy view of our possessions or our money, if we feel like no matter what, my problem is I just need more income, maybe we're just spending too much, or I can't be generous, I can't afford to be generous. Jesus says if you want to be, if you want to be, if you want to be perfect, if you, that word means mature, if you want to be mature, if you want to be a spiritual adult, if you want to grow in your faith, it starts by understanding that if I consume everything on myself, all I will ever be is spoiled. But if I'm willing to release, if I'm willing to let go, 
if my identity can be some, in something other than what I have, it's astonishing what God can do with that. It's a discipleship issue. And this is what I want you to hear today. Marriage is a discipleship issue. Divorce is a discipleship issue. Singleness is a discipleship issue. Children is a discipleship issue. Finances is a discipleship issue. Every part of our life comes under the Lordship of Jesus, not just the parts we want. Can we bow our heads? Father, um, thank you. Um, you have given us clear words, but we don't always know how to respond. We really do depend a lot on your spirit, so take the words that have been spoken today and help us realize that our faith in you is not a hobby, but it's a perspective. It's the way we see all of life. In Jesus' name, amen.